This is the CBS Evening News, Dan Rather reporting. Good evening. South Africa's anti-apartheid movement claimed a major victory today and also suffered a painful loss. Hundreds of political prisoners ended a hunger strike after the white minority government reportedly agreed to free most of the prisoners it is holding without trial. At the same time, the movement had to renounce a symbolic leader. Correspondent Martha Teichner has a report on the changing South Africa scene. Hiding from the press all day, a besieged Winnie Mandela finally left her office shielded by her football team bodyguards. It is her involvement in their activities that today forced leaders of South Africa's anti-apartheid movement to repudiate the woman they themselves once called the mother of the nation. We have been outraged by the reign of terror that the team has been associated with. Mrs. Mandela and her football team are now under investigation in at least three murder cases. It was the killing of Stompy Moketsi that finally brought about her condemnation. The 14-year-old activist was reportedly last seen being carried away from the Mandela house by members of the football team, savagely beaten. Had Stompy not been abducted by Mrs. Mandela's football team, he would have been alive today. Today, major players in South Africa's black community effectively wrote Winnie Mandela's political obituary. Dread um, a great name unnecessarily in the mud, and we could not afford it in our struggle. The South African government was quick to take advantage of a propaganda windfall against her jailed husband's organization, the outlawed African National Congress. The children of violence that they themselves have bred have in fact now started to eat up the organization that gave them birth. Weakened by its internal struggle, the anti-apartheid movement today was strengthened by what is widely regarded as a major victory against South Africa's policy of detention without trial. Determined to avoid an international crisis, the government quietly made a deal to release many, if not most, political detainees in return for the end of a three and a half week hunger strike. Never ever have they been shaken, shaken in their boots like they are today. What should have been the anti-apartheid movement's finest hour was tempered by the downfall of its first lady. Today, both the government and the anti-apartheid movement lost something significant. Martha Teichner, CBS News, Johannesburg. President Bush today promised to keep U.S. military aid flowing to rebels who were close to final victory in Afghanistan. He also said he was not giving up on the Nicaraguan rebels, the Contras, who were close to final defeat in Central America. Foreign Affairs led the agenda today as President Bush held a wide-ranging interview with reporters in the Oval Office. CBS News White House correspondent Leslie Stahl has our report. President Bush announced that the U.S. will continue to supply rebel forces in Afghanistan with military aid. The administration charges that the withdrawing Soviet Army flew in massive amounts of ammunition and other weapons at the last minute for use by the communist Kabul government. It would not be fair to have a uh, tremendous amount of lethal supplies left behind and then cut off support for resistance. Mr. Bush also said he has no intention of abandoning another of Ronald Reagan's rebel armies, the Contras. I have every intention of seeing that these people receive humanitarian support. He expressed mistrust of a new agreement among Central American presidents under which the Contras would be disbanded in exchange for democratic reforms in Nicaragua. He said previous commitments for reforms have just been fluffy promises. Promises made, promises broken. And so I think we have to be uh, wary commenting for the first time on the pre-trial maneuverings in the case of Oliver North, the president supported the attorney general's moves to limit the amount of national security information presented at the trial, moves that could cause the whole case to be thrown out. There are legitimate national security interests that he is uh, obliged to uh, protect, and he understands this, but he also understands that the uh, judicial system should be operative and the trial should go forward and I think this was a new style Oval Office news conference just a few reporters called on short notice for a short time as it ended the president was asked about the frightening escalation of murder rates in cities across the country he said he disagrees with police who want a ban on military assault weapons such as the one used in a recent schoolyard massacre in Stockton California I would strongly go after the criminals 
who use these guns. But I'm not about to suggest that a semi-automated hunting rifle be banned. Absolutely not. Okay. The president expressed sympathy for his cabinet choices who've been forced to sell stock or give up pensions. He worried out loud that his campaign on ethics may be carrying things too far. Leslie Stahl, CBS News, the White House. George Bush has been in office less than a month, and he still has time to make good on his promises. Mikhail Gorbachev has been in power almost four years, and he may be running out of time. Today, the Soviet party newspaper Pravda quoted Gorbachev as saying, we have one more chance to make perestroika, that is economic restructuring, pay off. But as correspondent Barry Peterson reports, Gorbachev's opening of the political system has whipped around and now is closing in on him. It is democracy Soviet style. Former Politburo member Boris Yeltsin greeted by supporters tonight at a campaign rally for the new Soviet parliament. Yeltsin was one of the most outspoken boosters of Mikhail Gorbachev's reforms. Now Yeltsin has his doubts. Gorbachev's perestroika has not worked, he said. It has tried to do too much and has accomplished virtually nothing. The speech was enthusiastically received, a sign of Gorbachev's deepening political troubles as his country loses faith in his vision. He's in the midst of a mess, a reform that isn't working, where he doesn't know precisely where to go from here. Zvinigarad is barely an hour's drive from Gorbachev's Kremlin office. In this small village, laundry detergent was available this week for the first time in four months. I'm filthy like a dog, says this man. What have we come to? The storeroom is locked, the bins virtually empty. This woman searches for a fresh turnip. The cabbages are picked over and rejected. Here, the disillusioned, the discontent, speak out. During Stalin's time, he said, we had everything. Before, it was always good, she says. Now, we have this. If problems, failures, much less crises, develop both in foreign policy for Gorbachev and in domestic policy, he's enormously vulnerable. His authority arose. Right-wingers are not afraid to take to the streets to challenge Gorbachev's reforms. And there was a recent attack in the Communist Party newspaper Pravda against a liberal magazine for taking Glasnost too far. The magazine editor, a Gorbachev friend, believes conservatives are out to make Gorbachev give up his reforms. I think it fight not to push Gorbachev out. It fight to change his life. Last night, Gorbachev was on Soviet TV warning the country not to panic. No, he said to his growing legion of opponents, we cannot stop even if we want to. We must go forward. And as of yet, there is no political leader publicly challenging Gorbachev. But as his support erodes, the debate grows. Is Gorbachev's hold on power, and with it, his chance to improve life here, slipping away? Barry Peterson, CBS News, Moscow. And still to come on the CBS Evening News, Tom Fenton on new bomb threats because of the book Islam Wants Banned. And Doug Tunnell on the threat that ivory poachers will wipe out the elephant. Britain's chief investigator into the bombing of Pan Am Flight 103 said today the bomb was smuggled on board in a radio cassette player. Searchers came to that conclusion after sifting through more than 10,000 pieces of the wreckage scattered around Lockerbie, Scotland. The chief detective also said today that the explosive was probably placed aboard in Frankfurt where the flight originated and where there had been threats. All 259 people aboard the Pan Am flight were killed when it exploded over Scotland December 21st. British Airlines tightened security today because of bomb threats stemming from the Ayatollah Khomeini's anger over the book, The Satanic Verses. Muslim fundamentalists worldwide are gunning for British author Salman Rushdie. They insist his novel defames their religion. Our chief European correspondent, Tom Fenton in London, begins our coverage. British authorities are taking seriously the threat to bomb British flights to India. The threat comes from a group calling itself the Iranian Guards. And after demonstrations yesterday in Iran, Tehran Radio said that volunteer assassination squads are on their way to Britain. Iranian religious leaders have doubled to more than $5 million the bounty they're offering for killing Salman Rushdie. As the controversy over Rushdie's book escalated, 
The Foreign Office called in Iran's diplomatic representative in London to lodge a protest. Nobody has the right to incite people to violence on British soil or against British citizens. Ayatollah Khomeini's statement is totally unacceptable. Khomeini's edict that Rushdie and his publishers must be killed for insulting the Prophet Muhammad threatens to torpedo Iran's efforts to improve relations with the West. He's losing contact with reality. He's 86, and recently they hardly ever broadcast his voice on Tehran radio. He's becoming something of an embarrassment to them. Even if some Iranian government officials are reluctant, there's a network of Iranian hit squads in Europe ready to carry out Khomeini's orders. In 1987, an underground cell bombed the car of a leading Iranian dissident in London. Another hit squad here bombed a store distributing anti Khomeini videos. Tonight, Rushdie and his American wife are in hiding, presumably somewhere here in Britain. Both are under armed police guard. Experts say they may need protection for the rest of their lives. Tom Fenton, CBS News, London. In the United States, the book is selling out. Viking Press's first printing of 50,000 copies, gone. But while in the short run, death threats might be good for the book business, those threats have sent a chill through and raised the hackles of authors who fear the fact that a writer may be killed for what he's written. Already the fear is growing. There are writers who are not willing to come out and support uh, Salman Rushdie because they're afraid they might be targeted too. It's extremely scary to find that writers are now potentially on the block, so to speak. It, it's uh, thoroughly frightening. Most of the four million Muslims who live in this country have not read the book, but they are outraged at what they believe to be the blasphemy against the Prophet Muhammad. This is not an intellectual exercise. It is purely scandalizing the holy names, scandalizing a personage who is central to a faith. From London, a Muslim author and friend of Rushdie's paints a bleak picture. Salman may be safe for the next week, he may be safe for the next three months, but this threat will hang over his life for the rest of his life. Muslim, Muslims are extremely uh, dangerous people when, when the Prophet uh, has been insulted. I'm very worried for his safety and I'm very worried for what this kind of intimidation means for the future of literature. Authors who are used to speaking through their works are now leaving their typewriters, taking a stand to protect what is yet to be written. Betsy Aaron, CBS News, New York. Possible new trouble tonight for the John Tower for Defense nomination. More but non-specific inferences about Tower's private conduct are now coming from Kenneth Edelman. He's the man who coordinated President Reagan's U.S. arms control policy while Tower was negotiating with the Soviets in Geneva. Edelman said today that Tower's, quote, lack of discretion proved troublesome, unquote. He gave no specifics, but did say Tower's job performance was not directly affected.